as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets. It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome to another live episode of Real Fans, Real Talk. I'm your host, Emma Marie, and I have my two favorite guys with me, Legend in Two Games and Trip Young. We are still in quarantine, guys. What's going on? I miss you. Wish I could be there in person. Absolutely, and we miss you, too. Um, you know, can't wait for, for this to be over, but in the meantime, I enjoy these Zoom calls and shows with you guys. Boy, that's a fact. This is like our, our reunion. So I feel like it's a family reunion every week that we record, you know what I'm saying? Because we usually get to see each other a lot more. But, you know, we still got each other. And, you know, thankfully we got Zoom rocking for the past yeah. couple of weeks. So we've been able to bring you guys quarantine TV. Yeah, no, I'm at this point, I'm so used to quarantine. It's like going to be weird when I actually see you guys in person. Um, but listen, we are, Eric could probably tell us what day without sports. <laughs> <laughs> at this point he might have lost count because it's been so many uh it is actually day 62 wow um i i did lose track a couple times and i had to go back and like kind of re recount where we was at previously but it is day 62 it's crazy to even say that um and even earlier this week there was uh i can't remember there was an old clip i came across on espn and I just started thinking, like, I really can't believe we've been a full two months now without any live sports. Yeah. No, but you know what's crazy? Even with us being day 62 without sports, there's still so much going on in the sports world. So much movement. I mean, you got to witness the NFL draft, um, MJ's last dance series that has occurred every Sunday. So there's ways that we've still been in tune with, you know, our players. But there's obviously nothing like seeing live you know, shows, I mean, sorry, live games and, and really uh, talking about them. Yeah. So have you guys been keeping up with The Last Dance? I have to. I mean, like you said, there ain't nothing else going on. Right. <laughs> anyway, so it's Last Dance or nothing. But no, it's like just really nostalgic, uh, just going mm -hmm. back to that time. And growing up as a as a Bulls fan with Mike, uh, you know, being my favorite player and Scotty, you know what I'm saying? Like just to kind of relive that. Even though I was a little bit, you know, disappointed in in, in one of the things that uh, they showed in uh, episode eight, I believe it was, with Scotty, when uh, he didn't want to go back in the game. And I, got, I had kind of forgotten about that. And I think, like, you know, as a kid, you know, your love for the players and team, like, they could just do no wrong. So you kind of don't even realize, you know, what he did in that moment. But reliving that right now as an adult and watching that, like, mm -hmm. I would have been so disappointed at the time. Like, had I been, like, I guess the age I am now, I'd have been so disappointed. Like, yo, Scotty, you, yo, you didn't go back in the game, bro? Like, what? Are you crazy, yo? Like, that's the ultimate, like, I cannot forgive you for, like, I would have stopped rocking with Scotty because of that if I was the age I am now. Yeah. As much as I love Scotty and, and the Bulls at that time, if I was this age now, I would have stopped rocking with him because of that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember it uh, vividly because being a diehard Knicks fan and that happened against the Knicks in the playoffs. Um, I have always been a Scottie Pippen defender. I think he's one of the most underrated basketball players we've ever seen um, because of his versatility. When we talk about guys in the game now, like Kawhi Leonard, like Paul George, their game is really relatable to what Scottie brought to the game back in the 90s. 
Um, mm -hmm. But Trip is absolutely right. I know people who to this day will not forgive Scotty Pippen for that, who will continue to hold that over set. No matter how great his accolades are, or how great his accomplishments are, they will still say he quit on his team in a pivotal moment. Um, and I had the, the, the privilege to meet him about eight years ago when he got inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame as part of the Dream Team. Real cool guy, but he, he owns it too. He understands that there are people who will never quite look at him the same because of that moment. For me, watching The Last Dance, um, it was interesting because obviously, you know, I am, you know, I don't want, I want to say how many years younger than you guys, but I am a few years younger than you guys. So, you know, obviously Kobe and LeBron and, you know, a lot of franchise players right now are, that's my childhood. That's, that's my memory of the NBA. You know, if you think about it, Kobe was in the league for what, 24 years, 25, I'm 20, I'm 25 years old, or I'm sorry, 20 years. Um, and I'm 25. So the majority of my career, I have not gotten to witness MJ and Scottie Pippen and all those things, all those players um, during that time. I've heard stories from my father and uncles, right? So for this, um, this series gave access that we didn't have before, especially knowing that MJ has always been reluctant to be, he's not as candid, he's not as transparent. He's in fact shied away from media for a long time. We haven't really heard him speak on topics. He actually used to get criticized about not speaking on certain things. And so this, um, I had seen that he I had read that he conducted eight hours worth of interviewing, of interview. That's how much and he just sat there candidly with his, you know, glass of liquor, just talking from the heart. So for me, this has been pretty cool to see him in that light and to learn things that we just never knew about. Like it's, it's like the random little facts that you find out, like Dennis Rodman and his craziness with women and just so many elements about it that you're getting to these players um, for their personality and their habits and their experiences. So it's been pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, it, it's it's crazy because, you know, once again, watching this and I go back and like, you know, you mentioned about Jordan not really being in the media like that after retiring. But then now to go back and kind of watch, it was so overwhelming to deal with the media spot before before he left the, the first time. So all of the stuff that was going on and then it was like, yo, y'all really tried to connect my father's death to my gambling and whatever it may or may not have been going on with that. And it's just like, yo, like I'm supposed to be at the, at my pinnacle right now. I'm the best player in basketball. You know, we're winning championships. Like it's nobody's business. Nobody could stop us, but you guys are constantly beating me. So the mental strain that Michael was dealing with at that time, in addition to the physical of going deep into the playoffs every year to all, all the way to the absolute end and then coming right back the next year. So that physical strain plus the mental dealing with the media, yeah, he had enough. And when it was time when he didn't have to do press conferences after games yeah. or just do random interviews, he said, you know what, I'm good. And then now we get the we get to see though everything that was really going on. I thought the the last two episodes were the best two. I had tweeted out after both of them. Um, I thought the raw emotion um, him, you know, being kind of moved to tears as he's talking about the dedication he had to put into becoming what he became. Whether you feel he's a goat or not, he made major sacrifices to get to that point. And, you know, they were teammates. He may have rubbed the wrong way. There may have been media types who didn't really like him. But ultimately, as I always say, we expect our athletes to be the best version of themselves on the court. And we don't really care what goes on off the court. We could front all we want, but at the end of the day, we don't care. We want that guy to drop his 30 points tonight and perform when it's time to perform. And Mike did that every time he was on the court. As a diehard Knicks fan, like I said, I have the utmost respect for Michael Jordan because I remember seeing him play night in, night out. There was no load management in the 90s. There wasn't this, oh, I'm taking a night off. Mike yeah, played every Rodman. night. Well, Rodman was the exception, you know. But he played every night, and he even made a point. I remember him, him saying it during the second 3 P where he said, if I take a night off, there's a fan who paid for a ticket to come see me tonight who will never get to see me again. So it's my obligation to give them the best version of me. Wow. And, you know, and uh, I believe it was episode uh, six when they talked about the, the Jordan ones, when he put him back on for his last game at the Garden. He literally was playing with blisters and his feet bleeding and still went out and dropped 40 plus points because he knew this is my last time at the Garden. This is the last time New York City is going to get to see me in person. So let me give them the best version of me. Yeah. And you know what? When you, um, Tripp was speaking about 
you know, him being criticized in, in the media or not, when he didn't have to speak in front of media, he didn't. If you think about it in 2020, you know, social media has provided these athletes to have their own, essentially their platforms are like their own media, net, you know, platform, because if you have, you know, 10 million followers on your Twitter, on your Instagram, that is the numbers that news outlets used to have back in the day right so now you can go and defend your honor you can you can speak your mind we get to know these players in ways that back in the day it was just a quick sound bite that can be misconstrued or a newspaper article where now social media has changed the game so you know we would probably be saying those same things about lebron and kobe but they're hopping on instagram live dancing and talking so we're getting, you know, we're getting an opportunity to see them in a in a, a more personal way. I think I think a lot of things Mike had to deal with were very unfair. Um, and even it, I think a lot of things that LeBron deals with now was very unfair. Uh, you know, again, we expect these yeah. guys to be the utmost professionals after some of the worst losses of their career. You know, they could have a devastating loss and it's like they've got to put that to the side and be ready to speak to the media within 20 minutes. And anything LeBron tweets about or, or posts on Instagram gets dissected to the point of somebody thinking like they know more about him than what they really do. Um, for Mike, though, I just think that was very unfortunate that he he had done it the right way. And then it got to a point where the media or certain people within the media wanted to pick at his armor so bad that they wanted to find reasons why he wasn't a good guy. You know, to, to talk about him and his dad going to Atlantic City the night before a playoff game, there's no crime in him spending the night with his dad and, and hanging out and just blowing off some steam after a playoff loss. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. You know, there's nothing. This is a guy who was worth millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars at that time. If he if he decides to lose $20,000 on the golf course, that's his business. Why are we worried about the amount of money that he's gambling? You know, yeah. and then when his dad passes away, it's like, again, they wanted to try to tie it to him. And, and you know, the type of guilt he must have been living with to hear people say those type of things. You know yeah. what I'm saying? When his dad died. He was 31 years old. He was still a very young man. Wow. For people to associate that his dad might have died because of his gambling, like that's yeah. unfair. And, that, and that's something that he probably had, that's a cloud he probably had to walk around with for a little while, even amongst his family. Cause I'm sure there were some people who probably even wondered like, damn, is it connected? Like, what did you get our father involved in? Yeah, yeah. Cause people definitely will start to speculate, right. especially in the family and knowing that he was gambling, he did have you no know, debts he was paying here and there for the losses. Now granted he had the money, but you know, when people when people lose their lives, especially in that type of way, you know, it can cause people to say, "Wait a minute, did he? Because I know he did all this dude money, and I know he he was doing this." But again, you know, him losing twenty thousand playing golf is equivalent of us losing five hundred playing a dice game. You know what I'm saying? So he yeah. got that. He, he... I never understand why people um, criticize the type of things that any celebrity spends money on when their paycheck is something that many people will never see in their life. Exactly. So it's like pennies. Well, the, <laughs> the, 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 the irony, and that's a great point, Em, is that an athlete or a, a, an actor will get criticized when we find out what they're getting paid, right? So LeBron is getting 30 plus million dollars and there'll be that group of people, oh, that's, he's not worth that, that's too much money for someone to be making. And then on the flip side is like, so you're mad at he's making that money, and then you're mad at how he's spending that money. Yeah, like, like it's his money. Like, what do? Why are you counting that man's pockets? Yeah, you know, it's it's unfortunate. Um, like I said, to me, the last two were the best because I thought Mike was at his rawest and just letting us know like what went into it. Um, you know, the fight with Steve Curry and him saying, you know, I, I was immediately remorseful that it got to that point because I wasn't mad at Steve Curry. I was mad at the coach. Um, but. Again, you know, there's a certain mindset you got to have to be great. And a lot of people don't have it. Uh, a lot of people will never understand it. I'm not saying that I fully understand it because I, I probably would have been a guy who after a couple of championships, I probably would wanted to spend more time with the family and just kick back. But yeah. he had that drive to be like, no, I need more. I, I want more victories. I want more accomplishments. And to me, I always say people forget, you know, I, I kind of joked about it when I said Mike was smoking and drinking and gambling and still winning championships. Michael Jordan won six NBA championships, won two gold medals. He won a college championship. Like Michael Jordan, when it when the when the lights were the brightest, he performed. You were not gonna beat him in that moment. Yeah, and even if he didn't come back after baseball, he would have still been looked at as one of the greatest of all time. Maybe not necessarily the goat, because I know the extra three rings and all other accolades those couple of years go along with it. But he's still going into the Hall of Fame first ballot. 
So, you know, he could have just been like, you know, we'll play baseball. And then when they had that little strike, I'm just retire and stay at home and spend this time with the family. You know, I don't have my dad here, so I want to give my family a little bit more time. But, no, he, he had that itch. He wanted to go back. He wanted to, you know, to play and, and, and win more. And that's what he did, and he did it better than anybody else. Moving forward in NBA, Shaq and Charles Barkley um, basically put some statements out um, this week. Basically saying that they think that the NBA should scrap this season, that it should, listen, let everyone go home, let the players get healthy, let the fans stay healthy, and just scrap it. And he also stated that even if someone does win the title, he doesn't think that they'll be really respected just because of the way the season went down and those who lost momentum that he just thinks that, you know, it should be scrapped. So some people and some articles said that, you know, he, he may have lost some fans from this comment um, because some players like, yo, we just want to play. Like, what do you mean scrap it? Um, so what are your, what are your thoughts on this? You want to go first, Eric? Yeah. Um, so I, I agree with a portion of, I, to me, there is no asterisk if you win a championship. Um, we've seen teams win in a strike shortened season. Doesn't matter. Um, there are so many elements that go into a championship season. Almost every championship, you could find a way to put an asterisk next to it. Um, there are plenty of people who feel like when the Warriors won their championships, they caught a lot of breaks with injuries. Are we putting asterisks next to teams who win because of injuries? No. But I do agree. I think we're getting close. Not quite there, but I think we're getting close to a point where it might be time to say, you know what? It's a lost season. Um, I think there are yeah. far too many moving parts. We got to keep in mind that there are a lot of guys, in order for this to happen, there are going to be some, some teams that are going to have to go into some form of isolation and quarantine where they're going to be away from their families as the rest of the season plays out. I think that's very tough to ask of, of guys to do. Um, I also would not be surprised if there becomes – you won't see the LeBrons, the, the megastars say this, but I wouldn't be surprised if you see that next tier superstar who says it's not worth the risk and I'm not playing. And when we get to that point, that's when it gets dangerous because – you know, if a team like Portland doesn't have Dame Lillard, like, are they really a playoff team? You know what I'm saying? So I think we're reaching that point. We're not there yet, but I think if we get into mid-June and we don't have some sort of resolution, we might have to say, you know what, it's time to scrap it. It's time to start preparing for next season, and let's just let everybody stay home and, and stay healthy. Yeah. Well, the big, the big dogs, they're ready to play because they already – they had, they, had the, they got on the conference call, LeBron, Giannis, Kawhi, Chris Paul. The top, the top dogs already got in the call. They're ready to play. As far as the fans go, the fans ain't going to be there anyway, so they'll be safe regardless. So that one, you know, you kind of X that off off the list. Um, but as far as the season goes, man, nah, you got you to – if you can have it, you got to have it. And like you said, there ain't no asterisks because at the end of the day, they're going to go back in. It's going to be the same thing. The teams that was going to make the playoffs, they still going to make the playoffs. Like, I don't see nobody that was supposed to make the playoffs falling off just because – we had this, uh, I guess, month and a half, two months off or whatever from, from actual uh, gameplay. Nobody's just dropping out, and they're not going to make the playoffs. So if even if you start right back now, it's going to be the same thing. And, I, you know, I'm, the players want to play. Most, I'm pretty sure even even the lower-tier ones, they want to get out there because at the end of the day, that's your check right there too. At some point, if you're not playing, that money stopped coming in. So even the low-tier guys, they want to get their they, they contracts fulfilled. I, no, I, I think if, if they took a poll and they said, you know, how many players do you think want to play? I would easily say 80, 85 percent. I think yeah. there's a small number of guys who probably are cautious about playing. Um, but we got to remember. Reasons. Right. We, we've got to remember the, the numbers haven't started to curve anywhere. So, yeah. you know, again, what are the logistics like for this to happen? Are we putting all the players in one city and saying, hey, we're playing all the games here? Are we still expecting guys to travel city to city to play? Like, there have been a lot of different um, ideas floated around as far as maybe you set up two, quote-unquote, campuses where you have uh, eight teams sitting in Orlando and they all play out of that location and another eight teams in Vegas. But even with that, like I said, there's still issues you got to figure out because if, if you're telling me I've got to be away from my family for the next two and a half months to play these playoffs, all right, get it. That's my job. I've got to do it. But then are you also telling me that I can only stay within the, the, the confines of that facility? I'm not going to be able to go out either. Like, that's the other tough part in this, too, because what are the logistics like? If you're telling me we're putting eight teams in Las Vegas, are we saying that none of these teams are ever going to walk around Las Vegas and do the other things that are going on within that city? Because keep in mind, their mayor has already come out that they want to reopen the casinos and they want to reopen that nightlife over there. So you're, you're putting other people at risk now that if I put you in a city that has opened back up, 
I can't force you to stay in your hotel. I can't force you to stay within the, the, the basketball facilities. And now I got to run the risk that you might have been out at a restaurant or you might have been somewhere and come in contact with somebody who does have the virus. At the end of the day, we're still not open. So saying to resume the, the, the season, we don't even know when, when we're going to resume the world. So I think it's too soon to even be trying to figure out with them playing. Like, I don't think that the NBA out of all professions in the world should be the first that are really talking right now, trying to get back. Like, I think that there's so many, there's so many Americans not working and there's so many jobs that are, are really imperative. And I'm going to be honest, it's like, I, and this comes from me, like I love sports. I know you all love sports, but it's really a sport. Like, and like, you know, and I, and this sounds hypocritical because there are people that work at these stadiums and stuff that need to be put back into work as well, right? But I think that the league needs to figure that out because they bring in way too much money for that to not even be handled, right? But I think, um, you know, there was news today that Los Angeles will be closed for another three months. Um, I'm not sure if you guys heard that. New York got pushed back to June 7th. So yeah, I think his comments make sense. Like, let's just focus. I think... I mean, to not scrap it, I don't know how you can continue the season as it pushes towards next year. You know what I mean? So, because we don't know when we're open. If we're open right now, then you, then it's like, yeah, but we're still, like, the world is still closed. So, yeah, um, it yeah I mean, a hard, I agree. hard deadline to start. Huh? So let's say, it would have to be, like, a hard deadline to start. So, let's say if, if they'll, they'll say, all right, if, the, if everything is not opened up by August 15th, that's it. There's no, we can't, we can't do it after that. Yeah, you know, there'd have to be something like that to where, all right, now we're gonna scrap the season, but we'll keep it, you know, we'll keep the keep it open yeah. for now, and then you know we'll kind of play it by ear. But if we get into August, like I said, we get mid August, and it's not even looking like we're anywhere close to opening back up, then now we start talking about scrapping the season. Yeah, I, I agree, and, and like M said, the country as a whole hasn't even figured out when it's gonna reopen. So unless we have Again, I'm not, I'm not saying scrap it right now, right. but we've got to get to a point where we got to say, all right, look, we're, we're going to keep working on it. But if we get to this point, as you mentioned, that we, we're getting into, you know, mid-June, July, even August, at some point we've got to say, all right, look, let's just move on. Um, okay. I, I just think there's too many moving parts. And I agree with you, Em. As much as I love basketball, I understand that it should not be the top priority as to when no. we're going to get basketball again. I agree with that as yeah. well. I think that, you know, yes, there are people's livelihoods who depend on it and we're not talking about the millionaires and the upper echelon players you know there are certain people who are in our field uh in media who need sports to be back so that they can keep putting out content and keep receiving yeah. a check you know no nah, but it's it's true because even espn has openly said that they don't know how they're going to move forward with their personnel if there are no sports you know they've got yeah, they've got time slots well. that are dedicated to basketball that if there's no basketball what are we paying you guys to be here for um, so yeah. those people needed to be back as well. And we wanted to be back so we can talk about it. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I don't want to rush guys back just for the sake of saying, oh, we've got sports back on. And then worst case scenario, we get an another Rudy Gobert situation where a guy contracts it and now he's in this facility with other teams that now they're at risk. We have a situation where a young athlete loses his mother because she contracted it. Right. So that's the thing. I just think it's irresponsible to be trying to set these phone calls and say, look, you need to get back when these athletes have to go home to family members. This is a contact sport, you know? So this is a sport where if somebody gets it from whatever way, it can travel to people's parents and their kids. And so I think it's it's still a very serious matter. And I think that, you know, we should um, take it day by day and really think about what makes the most sense. But trying to rush the season or deciding to scrap it, I think it's too soon to even make that decision or have that conversation right now until we reopen. Oh, I 1,000% agree. I, I would love to see it back. But I think there's things that are far more important than that. And we, we've got to proceed with caution. And as you mentioned, them, the last thing we want to see is someone get sick and now their family's at risk because we wanted to force a season and, and see basketball. Trip, if you want to talk a little bit about the Warriors, minority owner Mark Stevens. Oh, yeah. You know, he, 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 you know, he changed his energy up since uh, the NBA Finals when he, when he thought it was cool to start pushing uh, Kyle Lowry when he fell into the, uh, to the stands. And not on him, you know, a couple of seats down. And he thought it was cool to, you know, to get in and start getting in the mix with, with Kyle Lowry. It was an ugly incident, you know, put a stain on the, on the finals because you never want to see that, you know what I'm saying, especially coming from an owner 
of an NBA franchise. Um, but, you know, supposedly he's been, you know, reaching out to Kyle Larry to try to apologize to him. Um, he hasn't really gotten a response as of yet uh, from Kyle Larry. I don't know if he ever will get a response out of Kyle Larry, but I mean, I guess it's cool that, I mean, he's tried, made the effort to apologize, but it's just something that shouldn't happen. So, you know, if, if I was Kyle Lowry, maybe I might listen, but there's a, probably a better chance that I'd just be like, I really just don't care. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not about, because you, you're a grown man. You know, you know, you should know already. So and if that's the kind of person that you are, I don't think that this event that, it, you know, changes you from being, I think that, you know, that's still, that's still in him. So I, I probably wouldn't. So I get it. But, you know, whatever. I applaud him, though. He, he, he did try. To make a mental Man, your man's was drunk. Your man's was drunk. Let's call yeah. it what it is. He was drunk. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He had he had a couple too many, and he he was feeling himself at Corsa. And that's you know. But I, I do, um, you know, I respect the fact that he's trying to reach out and apologize. But again, if you're Kyle Lowry, I mean, you already won the ring. We don't need to talk about anything else right now. So yeah. Yeah. You got exactly. The ring. And he's out of there, so <laughs> we all good. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think uh, obviously, you know, he did the mature thing. He needed to apologize. Apologize. It was very clear cut as to what happened. So he had no choice. <laughs> he now, M, M, as 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 someone who you you're approaching veteran status of sitting courtside, would you ever push a player if he happened to you know step step on your, step on your shoes or knock over your drink? He already did. <laughs> First off, I are so funny. I I absolutely would not. I'd be too busy being excited, sitting courtside and watching the game. So no. <laughs> so if they spill the drink on the red bottles, you ain't setting it off. No, because there's more where that comes from. You're like nah. <laughs> no, accidents happen, so it's fine. You're not a thug no more, Em. You used to be a thug, you know, changed, turned your life around. I respect it. Thug life still tatted on my <laughs> chest, but, you know, we'll talk about that another day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so Shannon Brown got, uh, you know, arrested, aggravated assault charge. Um, this was a really crazy situation because it's like we're in quarantine and people are still managing to get themselves in trouble. But, um, Apparently, the situation was kind of weird because he had a um, home, someone that entered his home. And um, apparently, you know, he took matters into his own hand to protect himself. Um, and he was accused of shooting two people. So uh, apparently, he fired the gun in, in his home and he got arrested. So um, really weird situation that happened during quarantine. Yeah. Well, shoot, shooting at two people. Shooting at, people. right. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a really weird situation because when I first heard the story, I, I thought the same thing. Like, what's the big deal if somebody entered his home? But then I'm hearing that his home was actually for sale and these people were doing a, a walkthrough. So, I, honestly, I, I want to hear a little bit more about it from his perspective. Like, was he not expecting uh, the visitors or potential buyers to come by? Or was it a situation that did they walk into the wrong home? And I don't say that jokingly because there was an incident where Tom Brady actually walked into the wrong home recently as well. Um, Tom Brady was down in Tampa and he was going to pick up, I guess, some, some offensive tape from the coordinator down there. And he walks into the wrong home. And even though a gun wasn't drawn on him, he was confronted by the homeowner. Like, who are you walking into my house? Wow. Um, so I'm a little interested to, to hear more about it because when I heard that his home is for sale, I'm like, I didn't, I mean, did he not know they were coming or what's, what's the dynamics there that, that would, obviously I, I would assume he wasn't walking around his house with the gun in his hand. So the moment they came in the house, he obviously went to his, you know, safe box or wherever he keeps his gun. So what transpired in that minute or two when they first walked into the home to the point where he grabs the gun and shoots at them? Yeah, he, all right, so the, the house was for sale. That's why the, the door was open. Right. Um, but it, I don't see, I don't know, because again, there's, there's still information that hasn't come out yet. So I don't know if it was a thing where the open house ended at eight o'clock and they was coming in at nine o'clock. Um, supposedly he did ask them to leave first though before he let off the shots. Oh. Um, and then, you know what I'm saying, that he let off like five shots. So, I, I don't know, it's a tough situation. Uh, I mean, he's he's um, he's in the South, so he he can carry the firearm. And I don't know what kind of firearm it was, because I don't think they specified that. 
you know what I'm saying? So he can carry, but, you know, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a tough one. Yeah. I think there's still a lot of uncertainty around it. Um, like I said, because even when I first heard about it, my immediate thought was like, oh, you know, somebody went in his home. He, he had every right to. Um, yeah. We know the story of Sean Taylor, who was in his home with his fiance and his daughter and some intruders came, you know, and he lost his life. So I get it. But then when I heard it was like the house was for sale and a potential open house, I, that's where the confusion for me comes in. Because it's like, there had to be some sort of breakdown in communication uh, for him to draw his arm, his pistol and then I actually shoot at whoever it was in his home. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, this kind of reminds me, there was a situation with L Cool J a few years ago where an intruder entered his home and he had to move really quickly and uh, the police were called and they were captured. And it was a whole thing. He had his daughters inside. I remember watching the interview and he said that he went into like go mode. Like he didn't even want to ask any questions. It was like, who entered my home? So in my head, it's kind of like the forced sale sign definitely makes this a very complicated, very complex story because you're like, okay, well, what happened? Um, I seen in the article where they said the couple noticed the gate was open and what was interested in touring. So maybe they thought it was a vacant home and they went ahead and entered. So even if that was the case, then that's inappropriate as well. Obviously, I work in real estate and there's certain precautions that you have to take when showing a home or seeing a home, right? So for one, IDs have to be taken. Um, there's a lot of instances where things happen with real estate agents in homes. So I think there's kind of, there has to be blame on this couple side though too. If, if the proper precautions, like their ID and knowledge of the home wasn't taken, then it sounds like they were roaming in the neighborhood and seen, seen it, it, it literally stated the gate was open. So they went ahead and, and went to go tour. So, I mean, I kind of think, look, if Florida can get away with stand your ground rules and all these other things, if Trayvon was walking outside and Zimmerman stood his Once ground again, in his neighborhood, they got the complexion I the think complexion. that he was Jeff in every place. Like, nah, I, don't, I don't think he should have been charged for a damn thing. I'm right. I'm not, again, I, I agree with you. I don't, I'm not saying he is wrong. I would yeah. just like to know a little bit more about where the breakdown in communication happened. If yeah. this couple took it upon themselves, oh, we're just going to give ourselves a tour, then no, you, you probably should have got shot in your foot. I'm going to just yeah. call it what it is. You, you should have got shot in your foot. Uh, you know what I'm saying? But if they took the proper precautions or the proper steps, as you mentioned, and then the real estate agent failed to tell Shannon, then this should fall on, there should be some, some uh, you know, fall on the real estate agent too, if, if right. that's what took place. Because now these people's lives were threatened and Shannon felt threatened, obviously, because he's in his home and somebody's yeah. just walking in. And meanwhile, somebody dropped the ball somewhere along the line. And right. if he said, first of all, he said, if he said, get out, at that point anyway, there shouldn't be no further communications. If I'm, this is my home and I'm telling you to get out, you know what I'm saying? At that point, you just leave and y'all figure out any other situations later. But I think the bigger thing here is why the hell is Shannon Sharp showing off his house during the, the pandemic that's going on right now? Shannon, Shannon Brown. Shannon, Shannon Brown. Brown, excuse me, not Shannon Sharp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah why, why is Shannon Brown uh, showing off his house right now? So you got a whole bunch of different people coming into your house, touching things, moving all around. Uh, well, he's going through a divorce right now, right? Well, still. I know, with the beautiful, the lovely Monica. I mean, no, no, I, I'm, I'm, again, you know, we don't know. This might have been something that was already in the works. Maybe the house is already up for sale the last few months, and he's just leaving it for sale. Um, it could be because of the divorce, you know, it's, it's, it's an asset, and they got to split the assets. Um, yeah. So it, it could be a number of things. Like I said, I don't blame them, though, honestly. You know, if you were in your home and you felt threatened, you have every right to do that. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. My, my question would be just where, the, you know, where was the breakdown of communication that led to this part where, you know, he's shooting at somebody who's thinking they're viewing a, a home that's for sale. Trip, do you want to talk a little bit about Taj Gibson giving back? Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Um, well, when this drops, uh, so, you know, you guys know we went, myself and uh, Eric and uh, Van, shout out to Family on 3, we went down to uh, to Taj Gibson's uh, charity event this past year um, at the at the park in the middle of Four Green Projects. Um, he has it every year, but now he's actually you know big you know first of all thank you to all of the essential workers, everybody that's out there on the front lines, the doctors, the nurses, people working in the grocery stores, transit workers, you know everybody that has to to be out there, anybody that's working in social services field right now thank you to all of you guys you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying for actually because you guys are really you know 
putting up the fight right now for everybody. So thank you to all of you guys. So what he's doing is he's he's going to be doing something for all of the, the NYCHA workers. So he's going to be bringing them food and some, some other things uh, on Thursday morning. So we're going we're gonna to pull up and, uh, and go support, um, you know, because, again, these are the people that's, that's really out here making it happen during these times and putting their lights on the, on the line for us and for our family. So it's good that, that he's doing that, you know, to show that appreciation. And Officer Ramos and his partner, Sandris, um, came out and partnered with uh, New York Knicks uh, legend. But before he was a Knicks legend, legend he was a Brooklyn legend. And Brother Taj Gibson, who has been continuously here on this court and in this area, showing the connection with the community. And how do we do this on the ground? You know, because no matter how citywide politics may be, patrolling uh, our residents is important and is real. And to come out here and say to the countless numbers of NYCHA, employees as we go into social distance a bit because they're going to talk about me if we know you know as we the NYCHA employees uh they when you think of first line employees you're always talking about uh those who are in the hospital which is important but these NYCHA employees have been here every day since the virus they're part of the essential employees so for these two officers and the PSA here to come out and just show a level of gratitude by providing food and partnering with uh, Taj, it just says a lot. It says that no matter how challenging this is, we're gonna get through it if we communicate on the ground in a real way. So this is just a way of giving back. We cannot thank these officers enough for what they're doing. In spite of all that's going on, they're out here continuing to do the job uh, that's, that's right. And so the district attorney's office is part of what we're doing, and everyone that's coming out to show their support for those essential employees. And I want to just keep emphasizing the NYCHA employees. Every NYCHA resident I have visited throughout this entire virus, I've come across the NYCHA employees who are in this, these buildings making sure the quality of life to the best of their ability. And so that's why we're doing this today in a real way. So I want to thank Todd, who's always willing to come and do what's right. And to remember that Brooklyn is always his home and it's about treating people with the level of dignity and respect that they deserve. We're happy to be a part of this. They're going to give our mask uh, to the residents as well. So this is a great initiative community led by those officers that are protecting the community. So I want to turn it over to Taj right now to say a few words, Taj. Uh, first off, I want to thank uh, NYCHA for doing all the work they do for the community. That without them, we would really be in a tough spot. Uh, New York Knicks are being supportive of PSA3, for being super supportive of Officer Rainbow, working for my attention. I was happy to jump on board. Uh, we're going to try to do these things. A lot more. The community needs them, and uh, we really appreciate everybody just being a part of this. And uh, we can take one how to continue to go. Thanks, especially thanks to Eric Adams, especially always showing support. Uh, it's been amazing for this community, been amazing for Brooklyn. Uh, we got to keep it going. Thank you. Yeah, and um, you know, it's always great when you have these players that give back to their community, and um, especially in times like now, um, we have a Jets rookie. Um, Mekai, I feel like I'm saying his name is so wrong, but um, <laughs> Mekai, no, um, right. yeah, I'm right. so bad with these names with the athletes, but <laughs> anyway, right. um, he was making virtual visits to Children's Hospital, so he's another one to definitely highlight as we move on to NFL. Um, right now, I mean, quarantine's crazy, obviously, people can't, this is affecting the charity world, um, so it's it's still nice that they're finding ways to connect with these young children that are going through, um, horrible things in the hospital right now, uh, whether it's cancer and what have you. So I thought this was pretty cool that he still took that extra effort to make virtual visits. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I take my hat off to Makai Becton um, for making that effort as a rookie to connect with those from the city. Um, and I think it's an amazing thing to do. Uh, again, it could have been easy for him to sit back and be like, well, you know, we're in quarantine, so ain't much I could do. And yet right. he was savvy enough to find a way to say, hey, let me connect with these people 
and show them that they have my support. Right. Yeah, definitely. First of all, I went on uh, about a week and a half ago. I had my first virtual doctor's appointment. It's lit. So I could imagine being the kid in the hospital and you got some of your favorite football or basketball players in a virtual freaking chat with you while you stuck in the hospital. Like, that's lit, man. I'm, 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 I hope he does very well for the Jets, you know, because of that. That That's super dope. And I, I want to circle back to one quick thing, as Tripp mentioned, when we went out there for Taj Gibson Day. I thought it was amazing that Taj put that type of uh, event together. And when I say in the middle of the Jets, I mean literally in the middle of the Jets. And the mm. support he had out there and the admiration he got from, from people out there and the way the kids look at him, like you could tell this event meant so much to the people of Fort Greene. And I even mentioned when I interviewed him, there was a, a level of excitement and buzz within that community that day that was crazy. We've been to a lot of events. I think that was one of my personal favorites just because of the location of the event. Mm-hmm. Yep, ab- absolutely. I didn't, honestly, I didn't think we was going to even be able to get to him just because there was so many people pulling at him. And, you know, when you're in, the, in your hood, it's like, you know, damn near everybody that's there, you know, so so many people were trying to get to him, but we were able to actually get a couple of minutes with him. And since then, We've been in communication, so he's gonna come back uh, soon and uh, and do a full hour interview with us. We're just trying to figure out um, if we're gonna do it on Zoom or if we want to wait and have him come to the station once everything open back opens back up. But uh, we're gonna stop out on Thursday. Uh, well, I'm gonna go out on Thursday. I'm gonna bring the camera out, get some footage and whatnot. Just you know, just showing the give back. And, uh, and, we'll, and we'll go from there. So hats off to Taj for that. As we know, um, Cam Newton was definitely a big topic in the offseason um, about where he is going. So there's been a rumor um, that he is open to going to the, uh, I'm sorry, the Seattle Seahawks are open to have him. Uh, now we all know that Russell Wilson has never uh, not started, right? <laughs> Since he's been knock, knock on wood. We knock on some wood. On, yeah. on the Seahawks. So uh, apparently, uh, People did speak to um, Cam Newton's team, and of course he feels, and, and so does his team, that he should be a starter quarterback. However, he is open to the idea of being a backup um, and taking that that position at Seahawk. Um, so it's very interesting because, you know, I'm a big fan of Cam Newton, and I do think that he is a starter. Um, but, of course, I mean, having a guy like Russell Wilson who literally does no wrong <laughs> on and off the field is um, – a hard person to, I guess, I don't want to say compete against, but yeah, he definitely would be a backup. Um, so what are your, what are your thoughts on, on that combination happening in Seattle? If I'm Cam, I'm not going to Seattle to be a backup quarterback. I don't have a problem with being a backup quarterback, but it's not going to be in a place where there's probably a 90% chance that I'm not ever going to get into a football game, which means that I can't showcase my myself you know, for next season to try to get a, a long-term next nice money deal. So mm-hmm. if I'm Cam, if I, if I got to settle for being the backup, then I got to go to Miami or the Chargers or one of these teams that either don't have a good starting quarterback or just not there yet or has an injury-prone starting quarterback, maybe Jacksonville, you know what I mean? Because I need to put myself in a position where I, at some point I'm going to get to showcase that, yo, I'm still that MVP level talent and he's not going to be able to do that being a backup for Russell Wilson. Right. Yeah, I, uh, Tripp is right. I think Seattle would be a very tough situation for me to back up in because you're probably not going to play at all. I think the biggest hindrance right now for Cam is the fact that he was held, uh, he was hurt all of last year and now with the quarantine, no one's getting the opportunity to see if he's truly healthy. And so teams can't interview him one-on-one. They can't bring him into the facility. They can't let their doctors even examine him at this point. So it's all up in the air. I'm sure there are coaches out there who are intrigued by his talent, but they also feel a little skeptical that is he 100% healthy at this point. And that's the toughest part for him. And um, I, I've been on record as saying I think the Patriots would be the, great, the best fit for him, I think. Uh, but he may have to go to Jacksonville. He may have to go uh, to a situation that doesn't have the strongest starting quarterback where he could possibly come in. Right, because Russell, I mean, and and this sounds uh, horrible to bring up, but it's the reality, right? We also know that this NFL, you know, they, they feel a way about their black quarterbacks, you know? And I thought about that too. Like, it's unfortunate that sometimes these teams have, like, their token as well. And, like, 
for him and Russell Wilson to be on the same team, and not just saying because they're African American, but just how hard it is for black quarterbacks in general. I think um, that that combo in itself. I just think they're both big stars that need to be respected. And I know even though he was injured, um, yeah, to Chip's point, it would be a disservice for him to go on a team like that with Russell. Like I just think that's just not a good idea, and he shouldn't be open to it at all. Um, I do want to spread the black quarterbacks out around the league. I don't want to to the good black Well, that's what I was kind of saying. I'm going to say, if I don't want all the black quarterbacks bunched up on one team, we need to show kids because, because again, this is right. a position for the longest time that they said African Americans could not play. Right. I don't want to see two good black quarterbacks on the same team, one of you know which is not ever going to get to play because even right. if, let's just say, if Russell Wilson has two games back to back where he throws three interceptions, it's still not benching him and putting Cam Newton in. Right. right. I, I mean, to me, it's more about I want to see Cam in the best situation because this is a guy who did win an MVP. This is a guy who did take a team to a Super Bowl. So let's not forget just how talented he is. You know what I'm saying? For me, I would like to see him go to a situation where he could, if he's not ready to play from day one, at least would have the opportunity to be there and showcase his talent at some point this year. Um, at the Patriots, I think the Chargers would be a really good fit. You know, so there are certain situations that I think if he could go to with the talent that those teams already have, we could be reminded again of how good Cam Newton is, as opposed to him holding a clipboard in Seattle, and we don't see him until week 16, week 17, when the Seahawks are already in the playoffs and they're just trying to rest Russell Wilson so he doesn't get injured. Right. I'd really look into Miami, though, if I'm him, because, you know, they drafted Tua, and, you know, you could give Tua, you know, extra time to get back, and they still got Ryan Fitzpatrick, and, you know, he can either be lights out or he can completely stink it up. So, I, you know, Cam could go in there and get some quality playing time. The only, only thing with Miami is that because two is the future, if you're Cam, no matter how great you play this year, they're not signing you long term. And then you're back in this cycle again next all season of trying to find a team that's willing to pay you. Um, you know, so I, I think the Chargers could be a situation because I don't think, um, you know, that – they're completely sold on moving forward with Justin Herbert, at least not next year. Justin Herbert might not be ready for two or three years. So yeah. he could go there and hold that down. Granted, they have Tyrod Taylor, who's another black quarterback, who he had to wait his opportunity out as well. You know, now he's getting a second chance, or really a third chance, but he's getting an opportunity now. So again, you wouldn't want to kind of shortstop what he's trying to do as well. Um, yeah. But I think no matter what, even if Cam isn't your day one starter, at some point in this upcoming season, if we get a full NFL season, we all know Cam Newton is good enough that he should be a starting quarterback in the league. There's no debating that. Yeah. yeah. So another um, crazy thing that happened uh, with NFL. Now, you guys know Robert Kraft, who, man, it's like we love and hate him <laughs> sometimes. He... I just love him. I, I love him. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, Robert Kraft um, is donating a Super Bowl um, ring to benefit the All In Challenge. Uh, this was a fundraiser aimed to provide food to those in need, including children, the elderly, and those serving on the front line for COVID pandemic. Um, he chose this ring because this was a Super Bowl um, that he felt represented the Patriots really overcoming and um, beating, you know, against all odds. Uh, but scoring on a very unlikely um, stage at all times. So this was pretty huge, pretty crazy that he even donated it to this challenge. So big ups to, you know, Robert Kraft making his way back into the hearts of those that definitely weren't a fan of some things that he was accused of last year. But, he's you know. Lit. Ever since he got that dream chasers chain, he's been lit, man. You got you to gotta watch out. Uh, you know, that's dope. First of all, shout out to – all of the celebrities that have um, decided to participate in the All In Challenge, because it's not just Robert Kraft. There's so many. Uh, Kevin Hart is doing it. I believe The Rock is. Um, well, this, this is so many athletes and celebrities that are doing the All In Challenge. AI is doing it. Um, so shout out to everybody that's that's pitching in and doing even more than what they're already doing. Because a lot of these guys have already donated money, donated food, and they're continuing to to find different ways to give back. To, you know, to the to the people in this country that could really use the use the help right now. And just so that you guys know, what the bidding started at was seventy five thousand, and the bidding for the ring is now at seven hundred and seventy five thousand, just under a million dollars for this ring. So I'm really interested to see how it continues to go up, and it's just you know all for a great cause. So we'll see.
what happens. Hopefully, it's, it's ten million. Right. I mean, listen. If, if you know, there's going to be people out there who want to focus on the negative news that Robert Kraft was involved in um, two years ago, and I get it. I completely understand that. But his um, his work with justice reform and with Meek Mill and Michael Rubin, um, and and him now willing to step up for the All In Challenge and help out any way he can. To me, those things outweigh the negative news uh, that he was a part of two years ago. And that's not to make light of those situations. That's just to say that what he's done so far as a humanitarian, I think, is stronger than that one mistake that everybody wants to focus on. Right. It was just one mistake, man. <laughs> we'll move on. Listen, it was it was a, it was a, it was a rub and tug. You know, it was a little rub and tug. Oh. Nothing, nothing crazy. It, it was a peekaboo game. He was just playing peekaboo. Right. It was nothing, nothing crazy. And in boxing news, guys, before we wrap it up, Tyson Fury's dad challenges Mike Tyson's to cherry fight. This is something that is insane. <laughs> so what do you guys think about this happening? Sat, sat down, Brown. In, in the words of Medea, sat down, Brown. Sat, sat your ass down. Don't even disrespect yourself and think that you can stand in front of Mike Tyson. I am Mike Tyson. I don't care if he's 50, 60. You cannot stand in front of Mike wow. Tyson. You need to calm yourself down. Yeah, I saw I, the video. I know you saw the video of Mike right now. He got a chill. Yeah, I, I need to know a little bit more about Tyson Fury's dad's resume um, before I, I would even entertain this because we know Mike's resume. And yeah. um, unless Tyson Fury's dad got about 60 fights under his belt we don't know about, uh, I, I think you asking to die, bro. And, and if you're <laughs> not familiar... Um, go back and YouTube all of Mike's greatest hits. Um, you can see the workout. And um, and if you think you're still a tough guy, ask, ask, Mitch, ask Mitch Green um, what it's like to call out Mike Tyson. Because uh, when Mike Tyson put that extra human on Mitch Green's eye, that, that knot on his eye with the one hit a quitter, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it'll change your perspective on whether you really want to get in there and, and stand in front of Mike Tyson knowing mm -hmm. just one of them punches could just end your life. That's just disrespectful to an icon, too, like. It's it was for charity in his defense. <laughs> he tried to raise money for charity for COVID. No, no, nah, if it's for charity, and I, you know, from what I've what I what I've heard, Tyson Fury's family is a family of fighters, but I, I'm sure his dad ain't been in no type of fights compared to what Mike Tyson been in. Yeah, so, you ain't ever stood no. in front of them hands yeah. before. Yeah, you, or, or that that type of power. Yeah. before, <laughs> so you better chill. I I, I will say though. I wouldn't mind seeing uh, Evander Holyfield and Mike Tyson step back in the ring for charity. Uh, for charity, yeah, I wouldn't mind. Um, it's it's cool, you know. Both respected fighters, both icons. There is one fight that that's on the docket that I I hope happens just because I, I can't stand Oscar De La Hoya. He called out Conor McGregor, and I would love to see him and Conor McGregor fight because I think Conor McGregor would wash him. I do too. Mm. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind that Conor McGregor will watch him. I don't even know. He must be back on that on, on that stuff again. Because why would you even make a comment that he he ain't been in boxing in, in what, 10 years now? How long at least. Been? It's been at least a decade. Exactly. And you was already, the skills was already deteriorating at that point. So now you think you're about to get in the ring with a prime Conor McGregor. Nah, bro. I'm not last, time we saw, last time we saw De La Hoya in the ring, Pacquiao was beating the brakes off him. So... <laughs> Yeah, Conor McGregor, who Conor McGregor, who's at least twenty years younger than De La Hoya, um, I think would put a beating on Oscar De La Hoya, mm -hmm. and that's and that's no bias. I, I understand if they would be fighting, obviously a boxing fight, it wouldn't be an MMA. Uh, but there's no way you could tell me Oscar De La Hoya, who has not been in the ring in ten years, is going to be sharp enough to handle Conor McGregor, who's actively training and has been actively fighting for the last ten years. No yeah. way. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where, I mean, these guys get the boldness to, like, I don't get it. Because it's like, you got people in their prime and people who've had, and I'm not really the biggest McGregor fan. Maybe I just don't like him, like, personally, I guess, like, his yeah, character. I don't think do personally. But, but, you know, reality, it is what it is. Like, numbers are numbers, and he can fight. And so, to me, yeah, the challenge him in his prime, like, it's just, it's, it's, it's comical, like, I don't know if that's for charity. I don't know. That's just like a joke. No, no, no. That would actually be no, a... No, he, uh, he wants to uh, fight him. Fight. Yeah. yeah. And and McGregor but, has already said, I accept your challenge. If you yeah. want to do it, we could do it. But to this me... This is Mayweather. This is, this is not Mayweather. To me, this is all... Yeah, this is all to me. This is Oscar's uh, 
constant craving of attention. Yeah. You know, when, when Mayweather Fort McGregor, uh, De La Hoya criticized the fight and like try to make light of the fight, but yet now here he is trying to figure out a way that he could fight Conor McGregor, hoping for that big payday. And I, I've never been a big fan of Oscar De La Hoya for that reason. I think Oscar De La Hoya is a fraud. I think he tried to portray himself for so many years as like this elite golden boy athlete. And meanwhile, we know there are multiple uh, stints in rehab for cocaine. We've yeah. seen him dressing up in fishnets and cross-dressing for his side piece in a hotel. I said it, and it, it is what it is. He did I mean, those things. So, right, yeah. he did those things. So before <laughs> you could sit there and criticize another man, you know, he was quick to, to call out Mayweather when Mayweather had to serve those cu couple months in jail for the domestic violence. So before you call out a man on, on the mistakes he's made, live up to your mistakes. Yeah. Say what it is. You, you was in rehab a couple times because you can't stay off the booger sugar. We know it. So, <laughs> you know, if he want to fight McGregor, I'll tune in. I'm, I'm rooting for McGregor, and I'm not even the biggest McGregor fan. Yeah, oh, hell yeah. Definitely rooting for McGregor in, in that situation. I, I hope he does fight him so we can see that, that knockout right. happen. As, mu as much as I don't want an MMA fighter to, to go into boxing and beat a boxer, that's the exception to the that's, rule for me. That'll be the one. Yeah. Well, listen, with all that we don't have going on with sports, there's definitely a lot going on off these fields and courts. So I think we've covered so much of it. Um, so until next week, guys, you know, definitely check out all of just the moves being made on and off the courts. Um, and we'll circle back next week. We are back here. Type of blend backing up misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from eight to nine for the older folks. So even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought.